Hello, guys. Hey, how are you? Can you hear me well now? Yeah, you, I can hear you well. How are you? Madeline? Uh, Zach? How are you? Um, I actually have another noon uh, Zoom call that I had signed up for, so I thought I would just hang out in this one for a little while and then leave, if that's okay. That's fine. Uh, okay. We are at will type of uh, history club. And uh, <laughs> while you're hanging out, maybe you want to check out our website. It's called omnicarta.org. I'll put it in the chat. Uh, basically, you we mostly talk about ancient history, but sometimes we dive in into Mayan civilization, Incas, uh, Aztecas. Uh, we talk about medieval times. We talk about um, not just particularly Western world. We, we did start with Mesopotamia and the first cities of Ur uh, and Akkadian Empire and all that other uh, stuff. So. We're going to be diving into Rome history soon. We start with attraction, uh, which we have recorded and put it on our uh, YouTube channel. So the, the website's called, and I'll put it in here right now, omnicarta.org. And here's Jane, she's going to be presenting today. Right. So what, uh, what draws you to the history uh, of my work? Um, I guess I'm interested in ancient uh, writing systems and also how uh, ancient number systems and just how people, how we organized ourselves and thought about things through time. Oh, I see. So we will, we will uh, somebody proposed us to do an uh, ancient writing system because we recently did Etruscans and it's been told to us that Etruscan writing system had not been deciphered. Uh, but, you know, we have a couple of experts here uh, that specialize in writing systems and, you know, would talk about Linea B or any kind of Semitic languages and stuff like that. So uh, we will organize something like that. Um, and we did something on Phoenician language before, which is the uh, family of Semitic languages. But, uh, hi, Jane. How are you? Are you ready to present? Oh, I am just fine and waiting to give all my pearls of wisdom. And I would say that um, I'm going to address in my talk the decipherment of the Maya, which will also throw light on how the writing system actually worked. Oh, excellent. Great. And then you go ahead and present. Then. All right, maybe we should wait a few minutes, right? Before yeah, yeah, no, I'm just saying, like, just to show the screen. Yeah. Jane, do you have any, any presentation you wanted to put up, or? What, I thought I was supposed to present today. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So do you, have any, do you have a PowerPoint you wanted to put up? Um, I have a whole bunch of slides and all that. Okay, go ahead. Uh, you can share. Yes, you know, I guess it's very hard to decipher any writing system if you don't know the language. That's that's probably one of the major obstacles, right? That's probably why they couldn't decipher the uh, Etruscans, uh, because uh, they don't know the language. It doesn't exist. Right, it's but think, I, think the, I think the Mayan language is still spoken today. Is yeah, it? Mayan, yes. Yeah, Mayan yeah. is not a problem. But yeah. I, we, we were just talking before. And the same thing with the uh, linear A, right? Uh, they That's didn't right. know the Minoan language. That's why they couldn't decipher. They did decipher similar system uh, for Greek, right? Uh, but, so I guess you don't know the language. Language is in thing. That's it. Uh, hard. I wonder if you could eventually learn to uh, create a language out of writing system. Would it be? Well, it's interesting when they were deciphering the uh, Hittite language, and um, uh, I forget who was the, uh, uh, I think it was a Czech scientist. Uh, they, he read, eat bread, and then what follows eat bread? 
drink water, right? So he kind of made it because it was part of Semitic languages. I mean, Indo-European languages, sort of Semitic. He was able to kind of use um, Indo-European languages and kind of made out what it means, eat bread and drink water <laughs> type of thing. All right, Jane, if you want to uh, at least put up the, uh, uh, the, the page. Let me share that again. Okay. Do you know how to share? Um, okay, where are we? Here we are. This is my slideshow. What I'd like to do is to be able to put it up and yeah, yeah. at the same time be able to see Isn't people. Share screen, share screen on the bottom. Oh, yeah, I have. Can people see it? Uh, you press it, yeah. press it. Press yeah, share press screen. The, share screen, and then you have to see the icon and press that icon. The icon is where? The, your PowerPoint presentation. So first you click on share screen, and then yes, you I did that. You'll see a lot of my screen that I'm looking at now. I see my slide. Okay, click on it. Okay, click on it. Yeah. Then maybe you have to click on a box that says share. Yeah, share screen. I see that. Yeah, then, okay, but then when you go to when you get your regular screen with your other things that are up, there should be a share box on that screen, I think. Correct. So we click on share screen within that share screen you should see a powerpoint oh i see screen yeah click on it click on it nothing happens oh. okay when you sh click share screen you get a cop you move out of zoom onto your desktop is that right oh here's share there you go there you go you got it Yay! Hey. Now I don't see oh, my. Uh, so this is a Gardner Magic Quadrant. No, we're seeing something else. Where is your present? Can you print? The, can, this is what you need to do. Is first click on your presentation right now. Right now, I'm. I'm. Uh, okay. Here's my presentation. Yo, click on it. Yeah, right there. Yes. Now oh, there you go. <laughs> and now, what you want to do is also you want to make it full screen. Yes, I do, and I know how to do that. Excellent. Slideshow. Yes. Yes. Do the best. Okay, you want me to go? Well, I uh, just want to welcome everybody to the uh, to our history discussion group, and today Jane is uh, graciously enough uh, offered to do a mind presentation. We thank her. I think, uh, and Jane will talk about her experiences. And, um, and then she will talk about mine. And without further ado, go ahead, Jane. Okay. All right. Now, before we do that, I would like to ask the people here how much experience they've had with the Maya. How many of you have visited the Maya site? How many of you have read books about the Maya or seen movies about the Maya? And by the way, Apocalypto does not count. You can uh, use a chat box to kind of maybe say what your experiences are like from one to five. Okay. So have I got any feedback yet? <laughs> a lot of one and twos so far. Uh huh. Where is this box where I can see? I'd actually on the, bottom, on the bottom where it says participants share. Um, on the bottom where it says security participants chat share screen. Oh, okay. Participants. Chat box. Okay. Next, yeah, it's fine. I mean, we know it's a five for you. So, <laughs> so some people say I have read some books. Deadlock also uh, uh, archaeoastronomy, but never visited the scene. The film, uh, being in uh, Chichen Itzo and loved it. That's Jesse, and then um, Gail says, "I just listened to great courses on Mesoamerica," and then Ralph says, "Visited Chichen Itza, uh, Uxmal, and Palen Palenque." Yeah, okay. I, I also visited Chichen Itza and Uxmal, uh, not not Palenque though, but 
many years. Well, it looks like I'm safe. Um, nobody knows too much. So <laughs> congratulations, Bob, for visiting Chichen Itza. When did you do it? Uh, uh, that was back in the 1970s, oh, about, about 1970. You're so lucky. I had visited that during that time, but I went back yesterday, yesterday, last year, and took my German pen pal over there, and I was horrified. Every inch of it is crowded with souvenir stands, was overwhelmed with tourists. The stele are still out in the open, losing all their carvings to the acid rain. It was an awful experience. I mean, she liked it because she hadn't seen it before, but anyhow. You can't climb the, the pyramids anymore, right? I'm uh, sorry, I can't. You can't climb the pyramids anymore, right? Yeah. Oh, no. Most of the pyramids you can't climb. They had too yeah. many accidents. Yeah, I climbed it when I when I was there. I was there like in the 80s. Uh, it, it was still open. Uh, it was pretty scary. Even there was... <laughs> Which one are you, are you talking about, Chichen Itza? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I was I, I was there in the uh, late 80s or early 90s. Right. I was able to yeah. climb it too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was and, and Tikal, when I was there at two, in 01, you could, you could climb the Star Wars yeah. pyramid. Right. But yeah, that, it was that's, like tough. That, that stairway on the bottom right of this is a good illustration. It's very steep, no handrails. Yeah. It's pretty scary going up. Yeah. One, one slip and you could be down at the bottom. Yes, yeah. they put in like a guardrail in the middle in some of these, but it, people managed to evade that too. So um, it was used in many cases for throwing down the bodies of sacrificed human beings. So, but the, the priests and so forth were good at climbing it. Anyhow. This is a picture of the city of El Mirador. And I suspect nobody has been there. Good. Um, right now, you can't go there and see what's here because it's all an artist's reconstruction. It's based on the foundations, which of course is still there. And uh, the above ground part is based on buildings that are still extant in the area that kind of fit into that foundation. Now, they're all painted red, and the red comes from cinnabar, which is the ore of mercury. When Bernal Diaz wrote about this in the conquest of New Spain, he also wrote about this overwhelming density of structures. Um, but in that, he said they were many, many different colors. So since this is a reconstruction, we don't know. El Mirador flourished between the sixth century BCE and the first century of the Common Era. It was abandoned, it was reoccupied. Many of the cities were, including the big city of Monte Alban. Um, it was built in a kind of swamp and in order to keep the fields fertile, they had two truck in tons of mud. The only problem being that they didn't have trucks and they didn't have wheels for the trucks. So it was all hand carried in. If we look down at the, let's see if I can do this without switching the side. Okay, over here, you'll see this tank or what it is called in Spanish, an aguada. And the aguada contained drinking water for the people. And I also suspect it was had partly the same purpose as the big lake you see in developments of new houses that are on quite a questionable ground, very scenic and very necessary. Um, if you live in this area, there's a wet season and there's a dry season. So you need to do something about the um, water supply. You can tell that this is very early in the Maya history because all the steps of the pyramids have flat backs. Later on, when Teotihuacan became a player, come on guys. Why can I not do this? Okay. Ah, yes, here we are. Um, the architecture is changed to what's called Talud Templero. And what 
it was was that two slanty areas sandwiched a flat area and there were little ledges. So now everybody can date Maya buildings more or less. Okay, so where were the Maya? I love this map. And to me, it looks like the wing of a flying goose over in the side. This side is the neck and down there is the tail. And if we start looking around this thing, we see over here is the Olmec area. And this is actually La Venta, which is absolutely not a Maya site, but it is Olmec. And the Olmec have been thought to be the proto-culture of the Maya. Um, the dates have got, get funny and changed every year. Every year they go back and things become more ancient. So nothing is absolutely sure. And what you learn five years ago is probably not valid. Our El Mirador is here. Over here is my favorite site, Tikal, which is recognizable right away by the very steep sided pyramid. I don't think there are any other ones quite like it. I loved it because the trees were still around it and I could sit under one tree and look up and there would be three kinds of toucans in the tree. Is it still, so, it's not in Mexico though, right? To call, is yes, it in, it's in Mexico. This whole thing is, um, this whole thing is Mexico down to, this is Chiapas, this is all Yucatan, it's all Mexico. Down over here, right above El Mirador uh -huh. is a boundary for the north part of, of Guatemala, the Petén. And over here, we have Belize and Quebec. So is it, so it's uh, uh, Tikal is, in, is still in Mexico? I thought it was in- No, Guatemala. no, it's in Guatemala. See, in Guatemala, yeah, it's not Guatemala in Mexico. Right it just manages to get it and, in. And El Mirador also in Guatemala? Uh, yes, El Mirador is also in Guatemala. Yeah. And uh, Have you been to Tikal? What? Have you been to Tikal? Tikal many times. You have? Ah, really? Yes. I thought it was very difficult to get there. It was. It was terribly difficult to get there. But what happened was that now if you go to Antigua, they have these little white tour buses that are air conditioned and will zip you right to the site in several hours. Oh. So that's okay. And of course, if you had money, you can always fly in. Um, and so it's become accessible. Okay. But probably about the time you were there, it wasn't at all. Oh, I, no, I wasn't, I wasn't there. I, I, I actually, that one, the reason I didn't go is because I thought it was like, uh, I heard it was dangerous because there was a lot of uh, uh, crime uh, going on, uh, tourist attacks or things like that. Well, when I went to Tikal around 1970, the only way in by road was from Belize. So you had to go down to Belize and then you could head in inland from Belize to Tikal. It was in the Patain area of Guatemala, which was relatively isolated from the rest of the Guatemala at the time. Yeah, Thanks. I was there somewhat later, probably in the 80s. And um, at that point, you could drive up from Guat City. I took the public bus. I nearly fell out the back door, which wasn't secured. I was saved by the Guatemalans. Anyhow, to continue, we have up here, we have the Puk region. And the Puk region was inaccessible at the time, except by car. At the time I was over there, it's uh, pretty near Merida. And so if you want to go there, you stage from Merida. And it has a totally different architecture. Now, what have I neglected? I have neglected one of my favorites, which is Copan, Honduras. Unlike the other sites, it's not in a swamp, it's not in a rainforest, it's in beautifully lightly forested hills. Probably at one time they were more densely forested, but somebody cut down all the mahogany trees. But it has a delicious climate. Um, the site is accessible. In fact, they, they bus some of the 
uh, tours in there. Did I talk about Chichen and um, Tulum yet? No, I didn't. If you take a uh, cruise down there, you'll probably be offered a day excursion to Chichen, but I think I described that enough. It, it's chock full of uh, restorations, which are, I understand pretty accurate. Tulum is another one of my favorite sites. If you go to Cancun, you can take a bus down there, either a tour bus or you can just take a regular bus. It's a delightful site, it will be very small. It'll take you about 20 minutes to walk through the whole thing. And it has a beach. At the time I was there, you could swim on the beach. Now it's prohibited to swim there, but you can sit there and look at the lovely water. There's a temple or other structure square, not pyramidal, uh, with the diving frog god on it. I think, and, and there's about a three foot wall, which may have been higher at one time. What I think it, it probably was, was port administrative system. If you look, there aren't really all that many sites on the water. Now let's go ahead and, no, this way. And here we have this kind of architecture you'll find at Chichen Itza and other sites that are a, a um, mix of both the Maya and the Itza, Itza or the Toltecs. And they were just column mad. Some of these columns have relief carvings. Some of them don't. There are an awful lot of them all over the place. And this is quite late. This is all usually after 600 CE. And here are the feathered serpents that everybody knows. Here's that staircase that everybody's talking about. Um, now, I have seen these feathered serpents in person, and I've seen them in many very good photographs. And I think all the feathers must have blown away because I never could find them. And going on, here's the other um, marker for um, Toltec, or it's a uh, mixing, and that's the Chak Mold, C H A C M O O L. And it looks very peaceable and welcoming and everything, but that little saucer thing that the guy is holding was meant as a receptacle for the hearts that were torn out of the sacrificial people. And this, which I don't really have to say anything about, this is what you see if you go to the Puk region and go to Ushmal, which is again, one of my favorite sites. It's relatively late, but it doesn't have any, um, it's a contamination <laughs> and it looks really different. So, it's very hard to say, well, this is Puk architecture, but you'll know it when you see it. Okay, this slide I had already shown people and what it is, I was going to leave it out completely because I felt, well, we don't need to do the Trans-Pacific or Transatlantic contact. But then I was talking to this really brilliant Chinese scientist guy and he verbalized that he was amazed that everything, all these things, all this culture could have happened down there. And I don't think he was talking about the vagina monologues, but the trouble is that we are so convinced of this Kulturkreuz that we really think that they must have had some help in kicking forward their culture. And what on earth could that help come from? Well, a lot of people think it's the Venusians. What's the evidence for this? Well, the Maya kept very accurate records of the setting and the rising of Venus and where it appeared in the sky because they needed this for planting and they also needed this for the calendar and the festivities. At the International Astronomical Union, which is a very high class conference, Apparently some years ago, somebody presented a paper and you have to be invited. So this was somebody serious showing that the Maya had kept track of the transit of Venus. Well, if they watched that 
for any length of time because it's the three hour transit of Venus across the face of the sun, they would need to spend the rest of their lives with a seeing eye chihuahua. On the other hand, they could make very thin obsidian lenses for this. They were quite capable of doing that. And now let us pass ahead to this, which is one of my favorites. One of these, darn it, come back here. One of these two houses up on the top is grave goods with prominence derived from the Han Dynasty, which goes from 200 BCE up to about 200 CE. And if you want to see any more of these, I was enthralled with them when I was a kid. You can go to the Metropolitan Museum, which has a lovely collection of them. The other one is purported to be from the Nayarit area. And Nayarit is the Pacific Coast answer to Cancun. Now, if you look at these very carefully, I think it's undeniable that there are similarities. Am I right? Of course I'm right. Uh, but on the other hand, we could say that the Nayarit one, whichever that might be, it could be either one, because I forgot which one is which. Uh, the Nayarit one came in without prominence in a time when looting was going on. And maybe if you turned it over, it would be stamped, made in China and brought to the United States to be put into the antiquities market. I don't know. But that's the argument against it. Harder to get rid of is eight to 16 tons of basalt. And I have shown almost all my friends these, this or another ones of the Almec heads that are so famous. And you've probably all seen one if you come from New York because there's a big fiberglass cast of one of them in the Natural History Museum. Now, this looks very African. It's hard to imagine that these people who more or less died out between uh, around zero, not common, not ahead, not before, um, would have spent all that time sculpting a face they had never seen. So they must have seen something like it. Now you can't date the soul. You can match it up with surrounding the soul. And apparently it came to the Tushla mountains, but the only date you can get from that is of course geological. So not relevant. It's 60 miles away from where the head was found. So it got there somehow. I have no idea how. Um, I, the only argument that I've heard against this is somebody said very dismissively, gee, you see people walking around like this, who look like this in the area today. Well, duh, the Spanish imported African sli slaves because they were supposed to be a little classier than the native slaves. So the African slaves did what people did and they bred. And today you see people who look like that in the area. And Belize is full of them. Now, when you go over here, we get to the Polynesians. Now we all know that the speed of a boat is proportional to the waterline length of the hull. These had waterline lengths of between 40 and 55 feet, so they went very fast. Um, they had, they were catamarans, they weren't canoes. So they were very stable. They could catch all the fish they needed to survive. The only problem would be drinking water. And in fact, there's a band in the Pacific that does have a lot of rainfall, which didn't, wouldn't have bothered them over much. They could fail. And so they could in fact supply themselves with drinking water for the relatively short trip across. The fact that it could be done and was in fact done the other way, but which is the way the currents go, by Tor Heyerdahl, um, is no argument that it did in fact happen. Any comments? I actually wanted to, I still don't understand why- I can barely hear you. 
Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I cannot so understand how do is the all my head uh, turned out to be uh, looking um, African. Uh, isn't that uh, you said like two thousand years old? What the the head? Yeah, the all my head. Yeah, that would be about two thousand years old. So how how do you how do you connect? How how did they see the Africans? Ah, that's the mystery. You have to, if you don't believe in contact, you sort of have to explain it. And that's a problem, okay? Yeah, so there is no explanation, right? There's no what? Explanation. No, there's no explanation. I sure don't have one. I haven't read any, do you? No. Okay. So uh, I'm sorry. I, just, just a comment on the Polynesians. I guess the Polynesians settled the Pacific Islands around 1000 AD. Uh -huh. um, so presumably any contact across the Pacific was before that. That we know. And of. so it wasn't the, so it wasn't the, that's right. So it wasn't the Polynesians who had any earlier contact. And if there was an earlier contact, they left absolutely no trace on any of the Pacific islands, which seems unlikely. I guess there is, there's probably better, the better argument is that the, some of the initial settlements in South America were Southeast Asians who came up around through, uh, through Alaska. Because there, there definitely, mm -hmm. there are genetic traces, there are genetic traces of Southeast Asians in Brazil. Wow. Really? So yeah, they, came the same, in, they came in very early, yeah. I've heard the same that the settlements came from through Alaska, correct? No, no, no. Yeah, the, 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 that's we we all know it comes from uh, through Alaska. I I always thought it was more kind of uh, more neighboring uh, uh, tribes uh, came through Alaska. We were talking about like what, like fifteen thousand years ago, uh, but the Southeast yeah. Asia that that is uh, well, I I actually I haven't heard that, but uh, yeah, I guess it's possible if they travel there, if uh, there are traces, genetic traces. Or could it be that the, uh, they just have traveled north, uh, you know, to thousands of years and then eventually mixed with the people in the Northeast the Asia and eventually uh, moved uh, uh, into the American continent? Uh, I, I think uh, uh, it seems like a very long way, <laughs> you know, for uh, to go from Southeast Asia. Yeah, but that's you know, interesting. Yes, I think we can all agree that we really don't know <laughs> and that the answer will probably come in the next few years if there's ever a definitive answer. And by the way, I'm talking about contact. I am not talking about colonization or anything like that. Simple contact. Are, Jane, are there any um, remains, you know, burial remains from times contemporary to, for example, that head sculpture that they might ultimately do genetic uh, analysis of? There are remains, but the trouble is that the Olmec area, which is I think the one that's probably most ancient, is um, the remains are selective. There are higher caste people that had special burials, um, there, there aren't, and swamps don't preserve bones all that well. So, and it's hard to find them anyway. Um, so we really don't have an adequate genetic picture of what is there and what might have been there and what might have been exterminated if, if all the people had been clanned because they were mad at the king or something like that. But at, yeah. least, but at least it's something. I mean, you know, it's not looking at a statue and saying, oh, I think that lo looks African or, oh, I think that looks Asian or, I th you know, it's not that sort of superficial speculation. It was yeah, the I think segment of the population that you could gen genetically identify. And if it's going back 2000 years, um, unless there was already a great diversity in the culture that would, you know, which I don't think there would have been, I think it would have been still relatively homogeneity 
um, I would think that those studies would give you some inclination, some indication of, you know, what were the origins. I, I think that's right. As I understand it, all of the, with one exception, all of the genetic information from Mesoamerica and, and North America are part of the same migration going back 14,000 years ago across the, the Bering Land Bridge. I don't think there's any genetic information other than that, other than these isolated Brazilian tribes who are genetically most closely related to uh, Southeast Asian groups from Indonesia and maybe the Philippines. Yeah, um, that's what I had always heard that it would uh, you know, um, it was the origin stories were more from the east than the west. I don't know if that's because of sailing conditions or, or what. Um, I cannot imagine they would have sailed from, from Southeast Asia directly into South America. It's just like uh, unimaginable. <laughs> no, I don't think it's unimaginable. Right. You, could, you could have, it might not have been a direct east to west route, uh, but you could have, for example, headed towards the south and then come up uh you know through chile etc uh, uh, i mean that's what the old whalers did yeah Stem well but we're have, talking have, about have, have anybody anything. heard of lucy lucy of course um, so you're Brazil. talking oh, Brazil, you're talking yeah. she's a, she's millions years old right or i mean maybe, maybe i'm wrong yeah three point she's two pre, she's pre three homo sapiens she's she is hominid australian attack He's not but a homo way sapiens. Pre homo sapiens, yeah. yeah. He's pre homo sapiens, right? It's so a, she's even before the scene, the, the niece of ours and all, and all that other. Um, yeah, scene. yes. Way yeah, before. she's seven million years ago and they're half a million years ago. No, yeah. three, 3.2, actually. Well, anyway, yeah, it will be interesting. Okay. I just recently yeah. looked. So. Oh, okay, it's interesting good. to see the genetics from, from some of those ancient, um, ancient remains. Uh, if nothing else, it'll be another piece in the puzzle. Um, uh, Jane, I also wanted to ask you, I hear the terms Mayan, Olmec, Toltec. What are the differences between those? Well, the first obvious one is linguistics. They spoke very different languages. Um, the second one is basically, these are tribes and they had tribal identification, um, just like the Apache and uh, the Sioux and all that. Um, they knew who they were. These people knew who they were. But they also came to this area at a different time, right? The Toltecs are quite recent, from what yeah, I understand. That's true. And, they're, and they're the all mixes, the oldest. So there have been tribal migrations and settlements. So uh, the all mix and their mine and Toltecs are probably, uh, I don't know, 14th century uh, CE, right? Something like this. Well, then you have to get into the idea of, well, where did the Toltecs come from? And then we'll have an argument that lasts all night. So- Oh yeah, as, as Aztecs also, they're, they're, it's the same thing. I mean, they're, they're, supposedly they came from the North, uh, from what I've read, uh, from the Northern uh, territories, but yeah, it's still in the air. Yeah, but my, my question was really, so th those are three different cultures or cultural phases at least is denominated by Western archeologists. Olmec is not Mayan, Mayan is not Tol Toltec, is, is that right? Yes, it's absolutely right. And at okay. least part of the differences is what I showed you in the slides. Their architecture was different, their language was different, their writing was different, their sculptures were different. Um, they were a distinct population. Uh, what time a, frame were they? What, to what time frame are we talking about? We're talking about a time frame that embraces from about 1000 before the Common Era up to the Maya collapse of 1000 after. And we are also talking about the current time because as you can see in my next slide, the Maya are still there. I mean, there was this myth going around. I don't know where it started, but the Maya had all suddenly disappeared. But they aren't, they're still there. There was in fact a Maya collapse that happened between 900 and 1000 of the common era. But they're still there, they're still speaking Maya. I visited a house just like this when I was down there. 
the one I had was improved because the whole floor was tiled with beer bottle caps. Um, the roof, which looks kind of charming, this may be a reconstruction for tourists at this point, I'm not sure, but the roofs are this thatching and they are an absolute wonderful host for insects. The dress that she is wearing, she is Maya, has embroidery in the blue strips. It's called a quipili, the dress. And the embroidery was used to be specific to the various towns. I suspect that isn't happening at this point in time. Okay. And if they had not been Maya, we would never have been able to decipher the hieroglyphics. I'm yeah. sorry, I didn't mean to go too yeah. uh, No, 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 so, uh, I apologize. Uh, I, I still wanted to go a little bit back to the Olmec cat. And, and I thought, uh, well, my question is, uh, we didn't talk about this, but what about this theory that the tour care doll tried to prove about the uh, trips from uh, Africa, specifically from Egypt? Uh, I mean, with all those boats, you remember, made of the, uh, how do you call it, uh, from this grass, uh, uh, the one they actually use it in uh, Lake Titicaca right now, but uh, uh, a similar, um, uh, the boat and the idea was that he made this transatlantic trip. Um, uh, I don't know, they've been very much popularized sometimes in the 60s, I think, uh, or 70s. Uh, he made those trips from uh, Africa uh, to uh, on those boats. He built up supposedly based on those models from Africa to South America. Uh, and I'm just thinking uh, if that theory, if you, uh, you heard, have you heard of that theory? And if, if that's so, could that have been a connection to the, because they could have brought some black people with them? Yes, it's also possible that that happened. I don't know what time frame you're referring to, but there were certainly black people there from the uh, 16th century on. No, 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 I meant before. No, no, no. Oh, before? Uh, when? No, no, no. Have you ever heard of a tour hair doll? Yes. Yeah, I just quoted him. He was the one that he, but he went from South America across the Pacific, and I think right. he made a I, I thought it was Atlantic. I think uh, he may have made a, a a later version, but that's not the famous one. The, the famous one was uh, okay across the Pacific, and he went from from the reeds. Before. Yeah, the boat made from the reeds or something, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. But uh, all right, but I, I, I thought it was connecting to the, uh, more to the Africa. Well, no, uh, he, he, he did both. Yeah, his probably most famous one is across the Pacific, but he also sailed a papyrus reed boat right, from right. West Africa over to the Caribbean, to Barbados. Yeah, yeah, that, that's the one I'm referring to. He's also trying to prove that there was a, uh, a contact like that that was possible you know, that there was a contact from between Africa and South America uh, like that or, uh, you know, I, okay. How did I miss that? Okay, thank you so much. Okay, let me go on here. I think I'm finished with this lady. And then there is the um, murals from Bonham Park. And here we see them having a great feast. You know, there was a, a myth at one point that the Maya were so peaceable and they never went to war. And because many of the cities aren't war, walled, so they don't have defensive um, means. I don't know why the, the myth started. Anyhow, here's a feast. They're having a grand old time. The, there's music, they're all dressed up. Um, it's very peaceable. But this is, a, this is the battle that followed. That's why they were having the feast, in order to have kind of a great meal before the, the fight. And if you look particularly at the one at the top, I love the composition of this. It's very artistic. None of them look particularly peaceful, right? And finally, if you get to the end of this series, here are the captives. And judging from the guy that's up there with the spears who is dripping blood from his hands. You can barely see it, but he is. These people are not exactly happy as to what is happening to them. So these are the murals from Bonampak. And now 
we're getting into the 1849 adventure of John Lloyd Stevens and Frederick Catherine. And I think, I did I mention that he had been appointed as ambassador to what was then called Central America in 1849, which of course was right after the Mexican War when Van Buren appointed him. And being an enterprising guy, what he did was to grab a guy by the name of Frederick Catherwood and go down and make these beautiful drawings of his finds down there. This was all stuff he uncovered using gangs of indigenous labor with whom he paid. And he actually bought the site of Copan for $50, which was a lot of money in those days. Okay, here's something you might want to take a screenshot of. It's the best thing I know to kind of get a, a look. It's from Michael Crow's book, one of them, as what happened when, really useful. Let me see if I can get this thing out of the way. Yes, I can. Okay, now it's not obscuring too much of it, but I would definitely take a screenshot of that just for reference. Now let me go ahead and Jenny, just click on the slide and then press down. Okay. There we go. And here is my beloved Tom. And you You've seen, you haven't seen this, or you have seen it. No. No. Okay. Here it is. That white stripe across the lower part is probably the remnant of one of the Sac Bay Alb, Albus the Mayan plural. And the Sac Bays, or white roads, were roads that were actually paved using ground up limestone that. Um, was exposed to rain and it would solidify and it would make these roads. And the roads connected not only to temples, but they also connected the various plazas. Tikal has a whole bunch of different plazas. And beyond that, the roads went from city to city. And here is the famous Stella 31 of Tikal. And I'd first like to say, what's a Stella or Stila if you are British? And what it is, it's an upstanding piece of stone on which you will find carvings of pictures, you will find dates, and you will find um, hieroglyphics and a message. That's what a Stella is. This one, thank heavens, has been put in a museum so that it's protected and it won't be blank like some of the ones in Chichen Itza and the rain, the acid rain. And it's very hard to look at, isn't it? But some very nice person has made us this wonderful drawing of it. And what I'd like to do here we go. Is take a quick look at it. Maybe not so quick. The guy whose face is in the middle of this thing is a guy named Siaj Chan Kawil II, which is significant, as I will explain later. And he is surrounded by many evidences of his legitimacy as a ruler of Tikal, which he definitely was. And let me catch up on my notes over here. And what I'd like you to do is see how many other heads or faces you can find in this. So I'll give you 
two minutes and tell me how many you can find. You, you, you guys can just share with the chat uh, how many heads have you found? Okay, talk, uh, Greg, talk into your microphone so I can hear. No, no, I didn't say anything. Oh, okay. Okay, how many of you can't see any heads other than the face? How many can see one head more? Everybody can see one. Uh, maybe one. Maybe one. Okay. <laughs> I think the better better get bottom, it. Right, bottom right and bottom left, there's two more heads I can see. Okay, good. Good, good, and, good. Uh, that's pretty oh, much yeah. it at this point. Okay. Um I okay. see about six. You know, quickly. Yep. Okay, over here up this guy, that is Yash Nun Ayin. That is Shiyaj's, who's the star, um, that's his father. And he's looking down on his son, which is a way of saying, I approve you're becoming the ruler of Chikam. This over here, if we want more legitimacy, is the god Kawil. And he was the god specially charged with ensuring that the succession was good. And that's why he's there. Over here, you will see with many rulers, is a string of beads. And the string of beads was to mark his holiness and his rightness for rule. It was a little bit like the mandate of heaven that the Chinese emperors were supposed to have. Now, over here, where are you? Come back here. Okay, here we go. In his right arm, uh, he is holding an atlatl, and he's also holding a shield, I'm told, though it does look like a head, of and it's a head with a, sh a shield with a head on it of the god Kin, who was the Maya sun god. And the Maya sun god Kin is the sun. And over here, we have the Kin sign on his wrist, which I will show you in more detail later. And then over here, Kin, by the way, it could mean sun, it could mean light, it was the day sign for the Maya calendar, and it could also mean birth in the sense of seeing the light. Okay, so now we have two more heads. And these heads, I take a pass on. This guy over here with his naked jaw and his two, I think they're eye pops. He may be the death god, Kimi, but I'm not even sure of this. I take a complete pass on that. There is another head up here. Here's the earplug. And if you um, are looking for faces, a good way to find many of them is to look for the earplug. Over here, this might be some kind of jaw, or it might just be a hand up there. But then we have the face. When you look up close, then maybe I'm not so sure. Okay, so we have a lot of these faces. On the side of the Stella is a full length portrait of Yash Nun Ayin, dressed as a Teotihuano warrior. He's also carrying an atlatl. And uh, as I said, atlatls were known from several thousand years uh, BCE all over the globe 
uh, Sergio told me that even the Romans had them, but that of course was much later, but earlier than this. Um, and we will clear that up. Over here, we have the kin glyph, which you will see over and over. And here is spear thrower owl. And spear thrower owl, now I will do some history because this is after all a history group. Uh, spear thrower owl was the um, head of Teotihuacan. And he sent his general, Siash Ka, over to Tikal to take it over, which Siash Ka did. And the day after the entrada of Siash Ka, which took place on May 3rd of 378 of the Common Era, um, the hitherto Maya leader of Tikal died. They said he entered the water, which may be a rather poetic way of saying he was absolutely dead, or it might be that he was drowned. Anyhow, he was no longer on the scene. Uh, Siyash Kak was only a military person. So Spirit Thrower Owl put his son, who was Ayan, no, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, who was um, Nun Ayin, he put him in, Yash Nun Ayin, he put him in as the ruler. And then his son was Siyash Chan Kawil the second. And you'll notice the second implies that there was a first and that first would have been Maya. So it's another sign of the legitimacy now of the Teotihuacan rule. Oh, Jane, uh, actually, since you mentioned, yeah, this is, uh, oh, you're probably gonna talk about this. Uh, it seems like this is the most uh, mysterious uh, culture to uh, work on. Okay, I'm sorry, I really can't hear you. I, it's my fault for yeah. being here. No, 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 it's my, it's my. Uh, uh, I, I guess this Teotihuacan culture is one of the least known and very mysterious one that uh, you were just talking about this. You, you're probably gonna say more, right? Uh, I always was wondering at the time when I was there a uh, long time ago, I, I think it was like 1000 years BCE goes, right? If I remember correctly. Uh, at the time, very little was known about it. Uh, it, it I, I wonder if there were any re uh, research made more data accumulated. Yeah, go ahead. Well, to tell you the truth, there was an absolute explosion of interest in the Maya area in the 50s and 60s. And it was largely taken over by amateurs. I told you about Tatiana Poskuryakov. She was an architect. Um, the guy who actually did this encipherment, uh, who was Yuri Knorosov, a Russian, he was a plant geneticist. That's what I've heard about him. I've heard other things that he wasn't. Um, there was Linda Shealy, who was an artist who absolutely led this and uh, just enormous explosion of interest in it. And that, of course, came with a whole bunch of new knowledge. Now, this is Teotihuacan, the ones. Well, it was I've, different culture than a uh, different culture than Mayan, right? Yes, different culture, but it didn't stop them from taking over the Maya region and making them vassal states. So this is, has anybody been to Teotihuacan? Yeah, I, I was there, it's near Mexico City, right? So I, I actually went all the way to the top of that one. That's the sun, right? That's the- uh, I think it is, yeah. yes. These are the most famous pyramids in Mexico, I think. Yeah. This is the most massive pyramid in Mexico. Teotihuacan was, uh, based on current um, estimates of the population, it was the sixth most populous city in the world. And here we are back at the Maya gods. I think I told you about Ishtel and Shak and Kimi and the maze god and all of that. But here we come 
to the ball court. Now, ball playing is a sport, right? What would this have to do with religion? In fact, what it does have to do with religion is the fact that the ball court itself became part of a religious practice. Now, here, every Maya place had a ball court. And in fact, these ball courts are found somewhat modified all the way to up to Arizona. But instead of making their balls out of latex, they had stone balls. And whatever kind of ball they had, it would go through a ring over here, you can see it. And I suspect they leaped up on this thing to get it through the ring. And people didn't sit there, they weren't the bleachers. People sat on the thing that's going across to have a full view. The stone yoke, of course, was just a ritual object. But this marker, just like football, they put down markers on the field, on washstone. Over here, you'll see um, stylized representation of the ball, part of the ball game. Here's the ball. They were all wearing yokes, and there were girl blow players as well. And I will read you the story of Ornapa and Balanke, which tells their story and how this became a ritual thing. By the way, it is said that the losers of the game, maybe not every time, but a whole bunch of times were killed. Some people think the winners were killed but I think that would have made a very dull game. Okay, so the story of the ball game is, yes. The story of the elevation of the ball game to sacred ritual practice is told in the Popol Vuh, the Maya's own story of the people. This was an oral tradition first transcribed in the middle of the 16th century later translated into Spanish by the Dominican friar Francisco Jimenez. The gods wanted a home for beings who would keep the calendar of holy days and days for planting and harvest. The world was easily created. On August 11, 3104 BCE, the gods came together, envisioned the world, and it was made. The beings were a harder, harder problem. They first nailed the beings from mud, but they all slopped over and couldn't stand up. Then they tried wood, but the beings couldn't move. Animals didn't pay attention, birds just chatted. As punishment, these last two creations were condemned to be food for the proper beings. Finally, they asked the earth mother, Shvirka, for help, and she ground maize into tortilla flour and made human beings. After all, you are what you eat. Of course, the humans being humans, the first thing they did was to start worshiping a shining false god, Seven Makor, who has jeweled teeth and claimed to outshine the sun. Times never change. He is backed by the gods of darkness from Shibaba, the Mayan underworld. Generations go by. Finally, a pair of twins, one Unapu and seven Unapu, the numbers refer to birth dates, are born to Shpirka. The Unapu twins are rambunctious and they play their ball game so loudly that the neighbors beneath, which in this case are the underworld and the gods and demons of Shibalba, the dwelling of the dead, get mega annoyed and send the falcons to invite the boys to play ball in Shibalba. But really, they want to kill them. The boys think it's a great idea and they stash their equipment with Shpirkak, who doesn't like the idea at all. And they follow the falcons. It's a long, hot journey. And when they come to a river and try to drink, it's a river of blood. Nonetheless, they press on. The demons are sitting in a circle and test the twins by having them pick out the gods. But their gods aren't there, only pottery images. The twins fall for it. The second test, they invite them to sit down but it's on a hot griddle. And so they fall for that. And then they're put to a little room where they have only a candle stub. And they are told that if they light the candle stub, they have failed the test. Well, night falls and there are all kinds of screams and yelling and weird stuff goes on. 
and the younger one gets scared. And finally, the older one decides, oh, well, it's okay, we'll light it. And they failed that. And then the next day, because they failed all the tests, they are killed. They hang the head of Unapu in the stable or breadfruit tree, for which we have a picture. And as you can see, it's very headlight. And so along comes Blood Noon, the beautiful daughter of one of the demons. And the head of Unapu tells her that he is the most delicious fruit she will ever eat. And all she has to do is put out her hand and she will pick the fruit and it will be wonderful. Well, she puts out her hand and Unapu spits in it, the meaning, and she becomes pregnant. And when she goes back home and this is found out, her father decides to send her out with the owls who are supposed to kill her, cut out her heart and bring it back to him to cook and eat. Well, um, they take pity on her and she finds a leaf that when it's crushed, turns into a mush that looks like tissue all crushed up and stores a significant amount of red looking stuff that looks like blood. Well, of course, when I got back from Thailand, where this was demonstrated to me, I ran over to the New York Botanical Gardens and asked them if they knew of any plant that would do this. And they didn't. And it's fortunate that they didn't because then I would have given up. But when I was preparing this talk, what I did was I searched the internet and I came up with this photo from Pinterest and there it was and the green leaf was teak. And now there is teak in Honduras, which is definitely Maya area, but the only teak in the new world was started during the early part of the 20th century from seeds from Mayan rock. Continuing with Blood Moon, who escaped to the earth, Shpiakot takes her in. She gives birth to new twins, Unapal and Shpilanke, who are our heroes. The mother teaches them the language of the animals, but they are just as noisy as their predecessors. So the same thing happens, but this time they can speak with animals and they make friends with a rat and a mosquito who help them when they go down and they pass all the tests. Well, then the pretense drops and the demons say, well, they're going to kill them. They're going and they're going to throw them in the oven. And the twins said, we don't care about that. And they hold hands and they jump right into the oven. The demons grind their bones and throw them in the river. And then in the river, they coalesce. First is catfish, and then they come out, but now as themselves, but now they're demigods, and they have the power of life and death. And they pretend to be street entertainers, and what they do is they go around killing dogs, which is awful, but then they revive them again, which is nice. And the demons hear about it, and since death is their prominence, they come up and they clamor to be killed and revived, which was kind of stupid because the twins kill them and then they don't revive them. And once they are dead, they shoot seven macaw and they get back the head of Unapu and they throw it up to the skies and it becomes a star. So that's that. And with us, we have very little left. And so I have been talking about very precise dates in all of this. And this is what is on the back of that Stella 31. And over here in the red, which really should be only five of it, um, except I'm too lazy to make another drawing, uh, you will see what's called the long count. The long count actually begins most of these Stella and it's a date. And we can follow the long count because they had the same bar dot system as the Egyptians. And as Greg pointed out, 
maybe there was some contact or maybe it's just kind of obvious because a hand has five fingers. And so they had five fingers equals one bar. And that kind of little thing that looks like water in the cave is called a baktun. And it's worth 20 of the next thing of which that little ear thing on the top of it is the Maya zero. And the Maya did have a zero. Even the Romans didn't have a zero. Um, but that's a cartoon, and the cartoon is worth next thing, which is called a tune, and there are two bars on that, so there are 10 of them. And the, the tune, it looks like, a, you can always remember it, because it looks like a little radio that you tune, and that's 20 of the next thing, that is a wina, and there are 18, and there are 20 winos, but the wina is only 18, Kin, and there's our friend the kin, and the next thing shouldn't be there. Now, if you want some recreation, let's see if you can find other tunes and other dates and other kins on this. Anybody got any yet? Well, about four blocks below the, the one outlined in red, there does seem to be four units and one 10 bar, or the bar is five or 10? Uh, the bar is five. So there's, so there's nine there, right? Four, nine. four, round, four round plus a bar. Um, there are nine Bakhtuans, but I'm talking about the rest of the inscription. Can you find any other dates? Hint, they're almost all on the left, on the right side. Well, there is that flower shaped design yes. sort of in the middle right which is a couple of things below a, a double double horizontal bar. Uh-huh. And but then ab that above that, above that to the right, there's a, I guess a rotated one with the four, four round things next to a bar. Yeah, they did that. And then over on the right hand side, not at the bottom, but above the bottom, there is that flower shaped piece with the, uh, what the tune, I guess a number of tune things above it, the radio. Yeah. And the wino next to it. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, there's a, there's a whole bunch of dates in this. And because of the astronomical data that the Maya so carefully kept, uh, we can actually correlate, and there are tables of Maya dates, which you can then read off the, the Gregorian or the Julian date from those. And, and the years tend to match up one for one, that is their year is similar, is about 365 days? Uh, well, actually, there's a 360-day calendar and a 260-day calendar, and each one of those has months that are relatively prime to the year. So the only time there's a duplicate is when it's, um, what is it, 13 times 360 or something times 260. And they're the Tzalkin and the Hob. And the only re way I can remember them is the Hob, H and A or eight and nine, and nine divides 36, but so the other one's the Tzalkin. The Tzalkin. Um, and they have the same date when they come together. Uh, it's a big festival. So I don't know, does that answer your question? Probably not. Well, no, yeah, I think it does. Any idea where the 260 day cycle came from? Was that Venus or some other astronomical thing or no, don't know. I have, I have no idea, no, but <laughs> maybe someone here does, but I don't. And. Okay, here are the typical things that happen. Here are the Baktun cartoons for Vinal and Kian. It turns out the Baktun is 
400 years. And of course, the turn of the Bach tone is a major, major festival. But just to complicate them, all those things have head glyphs. So they have an alternative thing. By the way, there's another calendar called the Lord's of the Night. We won't even begin to start that. Um, and glyphs, by the way, they can conflate. And little bits of a glyph can substitute for the whole glyph. And the little bit of a glyph or the whole glyph may be conflated as a super glyph or superfixed, which means it's on top, or subfixed on the bottom or either side. And so there's some ambiguity as whether you're, you, I'm making this up out of my head, the way actual word, whether you're looking at tu pa ha or ha tu pa or anything other um, combination of them. And here finally is Diego de Landa's um, writings on the Maya. He had a Maya slave. He asked him to write down I do, something in Maya. The Maya wrote down, I don't want to. That was found out much later. And then he asked him to write down the alphabet because he was convinced that all writing systems had to be alphabetical. So the, he said to the Maya, a, be, se, de, fe, which is, of course, what is their syllables in Spanish, their syllables in Maya. They're one fifth of the syllable in Maya because, of course, the Maya had ba, be, be, bo, and bu, every vowel with the consonants that they had. Now, that wasn't realized for a long time, so it made it very difficult to decipher. People just didn't know. And what happened was Yuri Knorisov happened to come to Dresden in February of 1945. I don't think he really wanted to be there, but he was there. And he settled into the place, as did most of the other Russian soldiers. And there was a nice library in Dresden. And what he found in Dresden was the Dresden Codex. And the Dresden Codex is one of the bark books. And it's coated with a gesso-like substance, which I guess was derived from the, um, from the limestone. And it contains a whole bunch of observations of numbers and things, possibly Venus. In fact, yes, it is Venus. They have a whole bunch of hieroglyphics. They have a whole bunch of pictures, which are relate to the hieroglyphics, which make it much easier. And Yuri Knorosov, who never set foot in our hemisphere, managed to do the decipherment. And my last thing is the treat I promised you about Copan. When I was in Copan, it turned out that this, which is inside one of the pyramids, had been excavated up to that first line. And what, try to get this out of the way. So all that you could see was like the first level of this, and it was all dark. And I did have some special advantages in those days. So I was invited in to see it, and it just blew my mind. Because here's what it looks like today. Come on. What'd you say, click on it? No, it doesn't do. So I'll have to go the wrong way around. Are you trying to move to the next slide? Just click on it and press down. Slide and I'm pushing everything. Click on it and then press down. Ah, oh, got it. This time it worked. Thank you. And this is the Rosalila Temple in Copan. This, thank heaven, is a reproduction. It's under glass. It's protected. Honduras of all places is doing all this stuff right. And it is absolutely amazing. 
And I hope all of you will come down and visit me one day. And that's my presentation. Jane, very well done. Appreciate it. We learned so much. I guess I have a couple of questions. Sure. Um, first of all, what was their government like? How did they rule? Uh, also, um, was there, um, yeah, let's just start with the government at this point. At this point, at this point, it's horrible. Um, then it was pretty bad. It was a monarchy and it, it descended in the line unless you were taken over by somebody else. I see. How did the, when conquistadors came, um, was there, uh, when they, I know that Mayans were able to resist it for a while. How were they able to resist it, first of all? And when they were conquered, did they die of diseases? What was the uh, outcome of that? Well, they resisted for a while because most of the interest was in Mexico, which had more gold. And if the supply lines were longer, the conquerors were the ones, I think, who mostly died of diseases. There was a terrible toll on them. The Maya died of diseases after they were conquered. They died of being enslaved in the mines. They died. Oh, well, I did have a few slides on that, but I'll, I'll see if I can go on to answer your question. Yeah, here are some of the people involved. Uh, this is Diego de Landa that I talked about. This is um, Bartolomeo de las Casas, who submitted to Madrid a book called The Destruction of the Indies, in which he, I mean, I used to be a volunteer EMT. I walked in rooms that were awash in blood. I cannot, could not read that book more than a few pages at a time. And finally I gave up, it was so brutal. They used to take the children, cut their arms and legs off and leave them to die in vast numbers. Um, this is Pedro de Alvarado on the end over here. He was one of the worst. Um, this is Bernard Cast uh, Diaz del Castillo. He was the one with uh, Hernan Cortez's expedition. Um, if you read it, his book, the conquest of New Spain, you will be absolutely overawed at the courage and the persistence of these men. And then realizing what all that led to is sheer harm. Does that help? No, it helped. Um, also, I know the mines weren't into gold. What was that whole El Dorado or was it Incas? Uh, uh, have you heard of this El Dorado? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was Incas, I think. It was Incas, I'm sorry. Uh, but I know mine wasn't into gold as Aztecas because they were able to extract a lot of gold from Aztecas, but mine were more spiritual and gold was not their primary, um, so to speak, metal, or they weren't into metal working, so to speak, in that regard. So, Well, the, the Mayans lived on the Yucatan Peninsula, which eight millions of years ago was all underwater and it's all a limestone um i guess not quite a plateau but it's the limestone platform and limestone has no mineral deposits other than the limestone itself so there was no gold there were no mines no no metal mines no gold and silver in in the yucatan peninsula the i guess the aztecs the interior mexico has lots of mineral resources and uh, peru of course but not the Yucatan. Right. Also, I'm interested in, particularly in their game. And what I was interested in, the way they played their game with, a, uh, with the uh, rubber ball, they used to uh, hit the ball uh, with everything outside of their hands and legs. And particularly some of the stellas or some of the murals, whatever, depicted them having a skull on the side of each of the hips. Is that, have you heard of anything like that? Uh, so basically it was the skulls of dead people would attach to their hips. And then when they played the ball, that was their game. They would hit the, uh, uh, those ball over those, um, you know, the hips with the uh, attached skulls to it. 
Um, have you heard of anything like that, uh, Jane? Or I believe that what they tried to hit the bull with was the yoke. And you saw the pictures of the yokes. Correct. And they all wore a bell player's hat. Um, even the female bell player was wearing those. So it's possible that, I guess, just like soccer, they could. Oh, yes, that's right. You're such a soccer fan. I think it was pretty close to soccer. Yeah. All right. Well, interesting. What about sacri sacrificing? Was there any sacrificial burials? I know there was one that was found with children being uh, quite, you, you could think the child was, um, you could think, you know, mutilated before he died, but they said it wasn't anything to sacrificial. It was just due to the fact that it was a conflict. Um, I don't know of anything like, have you heard of any sacrifices that were done? in uh, May. Sacrifices to the max. Um, Diego de Landa describes how they would come into the villages and take hundreds of virgins and children and sacrifice them. Cortez's expedition, as they were fighting their way up the causeway in the last push, they could watch their companions who had been, the, their numbers were dwindling every day. And the Aztecs were taking them up to the top of the pyramid and sacrificing them in, in full sight of their companions and throwing them down. As far as mutilated children, Pedro de Alvarado accounted for a hell of a lot of those. Um, and as far as Chichen Itza is concerned, when they looked into the cenote, um, they found a lot of human bones, mostly female. Uh, and because you couldn't swim out of the cenote, the walls were absolutely sheer. I mean, I myself don't approve of throwing corpses in my drinking water, but that's what they did. Uh, Jane, uh, I, I wanted to uh, uh, know, you have, you've been to Copan as well, right? Uh, I was to Copan. Yeah. Uh, so how do, is Copan uh, more uh, interesting than Tikal or, or less or same impressive I'm talking about? What, what do you say? Well, the interest in any of these places depends a lot on what you know. So if you're just the average tourist, you go to any of these places and you say, oh, a boca, oh, wow, a pyramid, I'm going to climb it, except you can't now. And it's a horrible experience because one is very much like another. But once you hear about the hieroglyphic staircase, or once you hear about um, some of the interactions with the conquerors or any of the history, because there is a lot of history that I didn't go into because I could have just spent two hours saying, well, then this one conquered that in such and such a year and this one and you would take away nothing from it, right? So there's a lot of history. There's even people that you can associate with. And I'm not happy with history unless it comes with individual people that I can know about. What, what about uh, getting to Copan? Was it, uh, oh, Copan. Copan is beautiful. I mean, just plain beautiful. The second- just, it's just the, getting it, there. Uh, how, how, as far as getting to Copan? How getting to Copan? Get, getting into, uh, I mean, like transportation wise. How did I get there? Yeah. Oh, I know how I did. I was in um, the Utila, which is one of the Bay Islands of, of Honduras. I was getting my um, dive master. And so once I got my dive master, I, there was a little airplane that flew the nine miles over to the coast and once I was there I just took a bus. Wow so it, it is quite complicated to get there. No because you won't be coming from Utila. <laughs> you oh, you okay. come from San Pedro Sula and from there I'm sure you can get a bus or you can take a cruise boat and they have um, day trips and things like that. It's not complicated at all. A little work on Rome to Rio.com and you'll be fine. Yeah. When have you been there? Uh, uh, last? Well, that was, I think that was my most recent visit. It was charming. 
I hired a couple of little kids to carry my coat around for a dollar a day. That was more than they were making selling uh, souvenir things. And in when, return, when was that? Oh, when was that? Let me see. I think that was in the 80s or maybe oh. even in the 90s. Probably in the 90s. Uh -huh. Okay. They're, they're very comfortable now. They have, at the time, my kids found me a hotel room. Now there are big hotels all over the place near there because it's become a tourist attraction. It's actually a sister city with Japan. And when I was there, they had an open air theater and I could watch the film Hachi. But Copan is uh, definitely worth the, the visit, uh, not just to talk, right? Copan. If it were only for the Rosalila temple, it's worth yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if I, if I will ever get there. <laughs> not uh, a problem. Does anybody have any questions or want to clarify something? Jane, uh, incredible work and very expert like yeah. work. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, very interesting. And uh, if you guys want to uh, rewatch this, uh, and particularly Stella piece, it was very fascinating. You know, uh, I'll put it on the website today. Um, we have uh, three. It's going to be a third one that would do be downloaded this week. I downloaded two yesterday. The building of pyramids uh, at at Truscans. Um, both were incredible. Uh, and now J Jane um, uh, Mayan. And I think the next one we're going to do on Mesa America would be Incas, I guess. We'll have to uh, decide who wants to do that one. <laughs> uh, you know, we've got to find, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a willing volunteer, probably somewhere in September. <laughs> okay, what's the website so I can go and look at it? Oh, I'm sorry. It's, uh, I'll drop it in the chat, but it's called omnicarta.org. Omnicarta.org. Okay, thank you so much for listening. No, this was this was amazing. I appreciate it. And uh, tomorrow we continue on stateless ethnicities. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, Singh. Uh, we're going to be talking about Kurds. We're going to talk about uh, Finna Ugric uh, stateless ethnicities uh, and some other ones uh, in China. Um, you know, Asia Minor and Europe. So please join us tomorrow at four and um, have a nice rest of the weekend, guys. Everybody else too. Thank you so much. Okay, Thank thanks you. a lot, Jane. Great presentation. Okay. Thank Great you. Presentation. Thank you. Yeah.